Welcome, everybody. My name is Isabel Yeniches. I'm a co-founder of the New Mexico Healthy Soil Working Group. And with me are my friends and colleagues, uh, Christina Alde Bondi and uh, possibly Rob Hirsch, who's in a hearing uh, right now, virtually, of course, so he might join us later. Um, if you are joining us for the first time, we are a grassroots advocacy group, and we are perhaps best known for our work to pass the Healthy Soil Act in 2019, which created the Healthy Soil Program that provides voluntary incentives and education to farmers and ranchers to improve soil health in New Mexico. And this program is now in the able hands of the New Mexico Department of Agriculture. So we have been holding these virtual gatherings here since the beginning of the pandemic. And today we are so pleased to host Dr. Mary Lucero. With that, I am happy to have with us James and Joyce Skeet. They are with Spirit Farm and Covenant Pathways in the Gallup area of Van der Wagen. Very dear friends and doing incredible work in regenerative agriculture, um, growing chocolate cake soil in the desert. I can prove it. <laughs> and um, yeah, James Joyce, you have the floor. Thank you, Isabel and the soil, soil group. We have, an, we have a word in our indigenous uh, Navajo language to Diné which means uh, dirt people. So we're a part of that kind of um, connection with, uh, with the earth. And, uh, and I know you guys are included in this tonight. And we're very privileged to have Dr. Mary Lacero with us tonight. And she's a real close friend to ours, which Joyce will, um, will probably go drill down uh, that path. So, but... Um, to start out with, I'm going to do an invocation, um, something that uh, in a prayer, and then I'm going to finish that off with a with a short song of inviting um, our hearts to come together. Um, we are a people who share in the sacred web of life, the beauty way. We are a people who are moved to awe and wonder by nature. We are people, the only two-legged on earth that can reflect on our actions. So we pray with humility. We pray that we hold the earth, the creator's gift with love. We pray that we respect, honor, and nourish. We pray that we pass the gift of earth to the next generation in health. We pray for wisdom and strength to do so. Amen. I had the privilege of building drums for the Mohawk Nation, and uh, they taught me a song of invocation that I want to sing now. There's a river of life that's flowing from his throne. There's a river of life that's flowing from his throne. Won't you come on in and sing? This river will set you free. We are
since uh, Joyce and Mary are really good friends, I'll let her take over and share a little bit of that relationship. We met Mary uh, several years ago and our conversation all kind of centered around soil, microbes, and the microbiome of our bodies, our guts, everything. And so our friendships really generated so much out of that. Just got to know both her and her husband, David. Um, um, on a much deeper level, we visit each other's places and spent time with each other and each other's farms. And um, so every time we have conversations with Mary, I constantly am learning more. I feel like she's a big encyclopedia and I'm on the first letter A, just learning from her. Her depth of wisdom and knowledge, understanding and studies is just incredible. Um, and um, it's what's so exciting right now is the farm that they've, they've started in, within the last year now and uh, regenerative ag farm and how they're really impacting the community right now and influencing them in, in a different farming methods. And so when we get together, they talk about the farmers and how they're working together with the farmers and how farmers are just coming to them to learn more and more. So we're really looking forward to listening um, to her. I am afraid we lost Joyce, but that was a very nice introduction. And I'd say, Mary, maybe just go ahead. They will be back. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is the, the Zoom world. Sometimes it freezes and sometimes everything works. But James and Joyce, thank you so much for a very flattering introduction. I'll try to make some of it live up to <laughs> what, what I have to say. And really, it's just been fun getting involved with other groups that, that have this interest in soil health, or I like to say health from the ground up. Um, what Isabel asked me to talk about today is kind of my converging journeys. So uh, a little bit of background, I think I began uh, down the path of soil health in, in kind of a different route than many people. I, I grew up with interest in, in agriculture and outdoors and was fairly naive going to school. I, I uh, got a bachelor's degree in agricultural education and, and in sciences. I taught school for a little while and found out that the public schools were really uh, not, not a place for original thinking and I felt confined. And so I went back to, um, to get my PhD and I went down the biotechnology path because at that time, that's really where we were seeing the growth. And uh, what I wanted to do was a little bit different than my peers. I know that uh, most of the people I studied with in molecular biology and toxicology were looking at biomedical approaches. And I was interested in applying molecular biology techniques to environmental science and, and agricultural research. And of course, at New Mexico State, there was plenty of room to go with, uh, with that interest. I, uh, as a graduate student, I worked on some environmental remediation problems. Uh, as a postdoc, I did some chili research. And then I found myself working at the US Department of Agriculture in a rangeland research institute. And I was really, what, what drew me to this group was the work of Dr. Jerry Barrow, who was looking at the plant microbe interface in a very different way. And uh, I think some of what he's, some of what Jerry had observed at that time is still penetrating mainstream plant, plant biology, but he was basically showing us that um, he had a lot of microscopic evidence that the fungi and the bacteria we talk about as critical to the soil were not just in the soil and they were not just on the plant, but they were actually integrated with the plant itself. And so the word endophyte refers to microorganisms that live inside plants. And to me, what he was saying was so profound in terms of the impact this had, the potential impact this could have on all of biotechnology that I just felt like I had to be part of that picture. And so I went to work with him looking for the, uh, trying to isolate the genetics of these microorganisms that were colonizing the plants. And 
spent several years at this. We, we identified many individual species and when the metagenomic techniques came out that are being used today, uh, we realized we could analyze in six months what had taken me 10 years to figure out before that and the game really changed. And we started to see this very complex um, picture of microorganisms that create basically this web of connection all the way from the soil to the plant surface, inside the plant and beyond the plant. And through these microorganisms, you can have um, rapid communication between plant systems, but you can also have very rapid change. In fact, there are microorganisms underground that are engineering plants to adapt to climate change more quickly than all the research laboratories in the world can, can transform in, uh, in their lifetimes. This is happening overnight as we speak in soils and plants around the world. And, uh, and so as you start to get this picture of just how incredibly powerful the microbial uh, presence is and how much this is driving the system, uh, in fact, I'm actually excited to see Jeremy Kloss on here because he did some of that work with, with our group. Uh, but, but when you start seeing this microbial community and the power it has to transform everything we're doing in agriculture, you, um, you start to recognize that the barrier to the microbial function is actually coming from the technologies we've developed in the last 100 years or so uh, in agriculture. So many of the chemicals that we're using as fertilizers, many of the chemicals we're using as pesticides are indeed doing what they say they're gonna do, but they're also uh, in the process, they're totally disrupting the, the function of this microbial community. And and so uh, a very simple example of that is the nitrogen fertilizer that we use. Uh, we know from research that's been done by the Joint Genome Institute that when you apply nitrogen fertilizer to soils, and they've looked at soils from, from several states and from around the world, when you start applying nitrogen fertilizer, you feed a group of microorganisms that are called denitrifying bacteria. And these microorganisms start very quickly turning that fertilizer that you just spent your hard earned money on back into atmospheric nitrogen. At the same time that you're doing this, you're, you're shutting down the function of millions of nitrogen fixing bacteria. These are microorganisms that take that atmospheric nitrogen for free and turn it into fertilizer for the soil. And so we're basically replacing something that's out there available and working by adding something that is uh, that you're having to pay for. And then as you build these populations of denitrifying bacteria, you actually increase your demand for nitrogen fertilizer because now you've got to feed not just your plant, but also this microbial community. And that's just one very simple example of how we've kind of disrupted this microbial balance in ways that are impacting our part, pocketbook, they're impacting the ability of farmers to maintain productivity and profitability on their farms. And this is where kind of my parallel path came that uh, Isabel asked me to delve into, is that more and more I'm convinced this is also uh, impacting our personal health. And I think there's ample evidence for this, especially nowadays, microbiome is now a hot topic. It's a word that you can find many uh, research publications dealing with medical applications for the human microbiome. And what, what we're, uh, I think because probably about mid-career in my research, I, I started really having to get honest with myself about some lifelong health problems that I've been having. 
I could see it affecting my work. I could see the pace I was keeping up starting to deteriorate. And I had been exhaustively examined by many, many doctors over the years, and I just wasn't finding answers to the problem. And I remember I was reviewing a, a manuscript that I was writing about the functions of microorganisms in plants one day. And I was sitting there with this horrible headache because I was having a lot of these headaches. And I was trying to focus on this, this illustration we had made for the paper. And it just hit me, you know, I'm thinking, why am I always so sick? And I started looking at this illustration we had. And in the illustration, I was showing what a plant does when it's associated with microbes. And of course, it's cycling nutrients, it's building soil health, it's building fertility, it's doing all these, it's building its own resilience to environmental change or to disease. And then without microbes, it's doing all, you know, all these things are going away. You've got soil problems, you've got nutrient losses from the system and you've got all this degradation. And it was like this light bulb went on that what was wrong with me is I've lost the microbial diversity affiliated with my own health. And I think it took that moment to really see the bigger picture of why it's important that we start looking at soil health. Because um, let's face it, if you look at the, the primary uh, problems that we hear about in the media, in national statistics, in debates. Healthcare is always way up there. We're in a country right now where more than half, according to the Centers for Disease Control, more than half of our adult population is chronically ill. And of course, the leaders on this, heart disease, uh, diabetes, cancer, Alzheimer's, some of these diseases that are at the top of the chart, are all diseases that can be explained in part by lack of nutrition. And our lack of nutrition can be explained by the loss of microbial diversity and general health within our soils. And so if we're producing nutrient deficient plants because we're growing them in nutrient deficient soils, we're going to see health problems. And I think this is when everything kind of shifted for me from kind of a, you know, I had a natural curiosity in the subject. I was fascinated with the plants and the microbes and this whole complex system about how they worked together. But I think it was when I really tied it to human health that I saw the urgency of it's time for us to change. We've got to get the story out. I'm thrilled to see the work Isabel and, and the Healthy Soils Group are doing to, to help raise awareness because the answers are incredibly simple, incredibly cost efficient, and incredibly accessible to the general public. And so with that in mind, you know, for a number of reasons, I, I left the research career. And, and I think some of it is, uh, in fact, I'm here with my husband and of course, he also worked in agriculture. He worked with the New Mexico Department of Agriculture for many, many years. And I think because he was working more one-on-one -on -one with the growers than I was, uh, he was constantly reminding me about how the policies and the procedures we have kind of strangle the farmers that are trying to act. And... I think between us, as we looked at what we had seen coming out of the university throughout our careers, coming out of our uh, government departments, both at the federal and at the state level, and what we knew from farmers on the ground, we really, our gut feeling was that the biggest impact is going to come from people getting back into our communities and working with our communities to make change. And so, um, when, when, when my husband retired, we made the decision that we were going to buy a farm and we're going to grow apples and raise a few livestock. And I think more and more for the benefit of soil health than to say we've got a big livestock production because uh, we've, we've got small acreage. But uh, part of what we want to achieve is, is some of that 
I think Isabel called uh, James soil chocolate cake soil <laughs> that he's building up um, in Vanderwagen. I thought we, we need to build some more chocolate cake soil and we need to um, kind of make some of this locally grown nutrient dense food available enough that people have a basis for comparison because a lot of people have never really tasted locally grown food that hasn't been uh, transformed by pesticides, by chemicals, by some of these things, you know, and, and we can talk organic or not organic. And, and because of certification uh, programs, the word organic has become more of a legal term than, than a description of the way you're doing your food. But but I think what we really wanted to do is, is start foods from the ground up and take careful notes and model what we're doing as we go. And, you know, micro microorganisms are dynamic and the community shifts and fluctuates with not only with every management decision, but also with what's happening in the climate and the environment around us. And we want the opportunity to document some of this and to show how those shifts in the microbial community are affecting the productivity, the, the food quality, and the profitability of an organization, of our, of our farming operation. And so we're kind of on this new journey, looking at how this proceeds. Uh, we bought our, we're, we're in Fort Sumner, New Mexico right now. And uh, we bought uh, some irrigated land uh, we got here and discovered that we really already had a 26 species cover crop growing on the property. The only problem with this 26 species cover crop that we had growing on the property is that about 20 to maybe 22 of those species were, were noxious weeds. And uh, so, so our first year was really spent uh, managing weeds. We put a as many cattle as we dared on, on our few acres and kept them grazing, kept them moving to keep those weeds down. And uh, when, when winter came, we, uh, we got rid of the cattle and we did a, uh, what, what people might say, you said never till the land. Well, I didn't say never till it. I said, reduce the tilling and, and remediate when you till. But uh, we actually had to go in and deep plow and laser level and get everything ready because once we put trees in, we're going to have many, many years of during which we can't move the soil and won't move the soil. And so over the winter, we did the deep plowing in November so that we could turn up those weeds and expose them to the cold, dry air all winter. And hopefully we've killed a few of them at least. And last week we reseeded with uh, 18 species of um, mixed legumes and grasses and forbs. And we're kind of watching the ground waiting for green to pop up any day. And here in the, uh, another week, we're going to be planting a little over 500 apple trees and, and peaches and uh, cherries. So we'll have a diversified fruit production about half our land is going to remain in pasture for, for feeder steers and chickens. And, uh, and we will experiment and learn as we go. And some of this, you know, we have a good comprehensive picture of, of what healthy soils look like and what the textbooks say. And the thing is, every farm is different and you really have to manage as you go and learn your way through it by careful observation of what's happening on the ground. So I guess that's pretty much, I know I'm a little short of six o'clock and usually I talk until people are saying, please, please stop. <laughs> but, uh, but I'll go ahead and take questions and, and let us move on from there. Okay. Thank you, Mary. I mean, what, what a, a, a rich resource uh, you are, and we are so lucky to count you among the soil health champions in New Mexico. Um, let's see, we have a question as to, and uh, 
can you name the 18 species you just planted in your cover crop? <laughs> <laughs> I saw that question come in the chat. Ouch, all 18 of them. <laughs> um, it, it's primarily, uh, we've got a mix of cool season. I'm not going to name them all because of course, <laughs> it, it, it went right now. Right, right. Uh, but, but there's a mix of warm and cool season grasses. There are a number of vetches and other legumes. There are some brassicas. And then there are some oddball forbs like uh, sunflowers. So actually, I'm using a mix that, uh, that we bought from Kevin Brainham, who mm -hmm, mm -hmm. crosses paths with many of you, I know. And uh, it's called a high diversity mix. And, and you can look up the company, find the label, and go from there. But, uh, but basically the diversity is what we're after. And actually I have been hoping when we laid all this out, I wanted to include some patches of native grasses. And then as we got to trying to look at what had been done in terms of uh, irrigation, native grasses growing on irrigated lands, everybody we talked to who had some background with it discouraged it. And if you price native seed, it's kind of scary. It's, it's kind mm -hmm. of like, uh, <laughs> you can buy another farm with that. Not quite, but, but um, we decided against it. And then as, as luck would have it, we really uh, miscalculated what our seeder was spreading and we ran out of seed. And we had a very small strip of, of you know, maybe a quarter acre of land that hadn't been seeded. And so, we actually seized the day and ran down to Clovis and we bought some native seed mixes from uh, Curtis and Curtis. And so I haven't counted those seeds in our native mix, in our overall mix, but we ended up doing about one acre of the pasture band. And uh, some of it was pure native seed and then some of it was this mix of the original cover crop mix overseeded with the natives. So my big interest in that, the native mix included uh, the black grandmas and blue grandmas and side oats grandmas that I had worked with in the past. We know that those grass species are loaded with nitrogen fixing microbes and microbes that enhance plant productivity. We also put some uh, cone flowers that, uh, because we had seen those growing here, those were among the few plants we had that were not noxious weeds. <laughs> And the cattle seemed to like them last year and they were doing well on irrigated land. So we included some of those and then there are some flaxes and some um, more forage type grasses within the mix. There's some orchard grass and other species. Thank you. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll um, ask Daryl to unmute and uh, ask his question and we'll go along that way. So Darryl, Hi, Mary. Hey, Daryl. Hey, good to see you again. If you're talking, I'm listening. <laughs> Are you uh, planning any uh, annual vegetable production in your future plans? Uh, we are, and we're going to get the trees established before we cross that path. What I'm thinking I'll try this summer is actually interplanting vegetable crops, especially if all the trees are small. Um, right put in some certainly things like melons and pumpkins and that kind of thing in between. And uh, we're, we're finding that it's a lot of management. And so we want to oh, yeah. uh, kind of not, we want to be careful not to outpace ourselves and, and get too many things going at once. Yeah. But we exactly. will kind of start small. Yeah, and then there's also the market for it. Right, right. Yeah. And so I think a lot of the a lot of the vegetables that we plant will really be for home, home use. And right. maybe a few, Fort Sumner is not a big town. Exactly. And so, um, you know, certainly local, local groups were very right. interested in, in dealing with Well, it's, it's nice to follow you and find out what you're, what you're up to. Well, that goes both ways. You've done how a lot. you're pioneer, pioneering. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't Thank know. you. There's, there's quite a few pioneers on this on this Zoom call. There, there certainly <laughs> are, and that's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> Follow each other around. 
That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Daryl. Uh, Greg Corning, do you want to ask Mary a question? Oh, well, um, yeah, I put it in the chat um, mm -hmm. asking about um, whether it's white, whether you consider it's important to use native plants as much as possible. But since I've got a moment, I this sound, I'm, I'm sort of like, this may come across as I'm trying to sound like a smart guy, but I just wonder because I hear so much about microbes, bacteria, 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 and the fungi, but I never hear about the archaea. But when I was a undergraduate in 2009 or six or something like that, I, there was a paper by these Europeans that said that the ammonia fi or the nitrogen fixing microbes in the soil are pretty much overwhelmingly archaea, not bacteria, they're prokaryotic archaea. And I wonder if anybody's worked on that. Like, we never look at that. So is that important? You know, the, the news coming out of the microbiome is growing so quickly. The knowledge base is just jumping forward in leaps and bounds because of the, because our ability to analyze those communities has changed so quickly that uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm not keeping up with all of it. <laughs> Uh, I know that it's important to have all of them. And what I work with, uh, I've done some grower workshops and that kind of thing, and, and largely focused on showing people how to look through the microscope and see how diverse, come up with some diversity assessments within their, um, within their population. It's not, you know, it's not precise, but it gives you a broad, glimpse at whether or not you're supporting fungi in your in your practices or and I tell people then you can't distinguish at that scale between bacteria and archaea they're just little specks but you want to have both because and and really you're going to have both wherever you have bacteria you're going to have the archaea the archaea tend to be uh, they'll colonize the more extreme niches within the soil so they tolerate more heat, they tolerate more of what, more uh, anoxic conditions, they tolerate kind of the, the areas that, that the bacteria might be stressed. And I think it's hard to say, oh, you need only archaea or you need bacteria, you need them both, you need the blend. Thank you. So I'll go ahead and read it. Um, and the question was, uh, would it work to plant the cover crops without having to clear the weeds first? Uh, I felt like, uh, you know, some of the, some of the challenges you run into a lot of, a lot of where we changed our plans as we went had to do with what tools were available to us, uh, in our community to use, cause we're a little bit remote. But I think the challenge with going right into the weeds would be the uh, getting the soil penetration that you need because the weeds were pretty well established. Our land had been a horse pasture uh, for many years before we bought it. And then what I understand is that the owners had passed away and so it had been relatively neglected. They had somebody coming out to feed the horses, but nobody was really damaging the land. And so there were a couple of years that, that these weeds were able to just come in and really get established. And while you really don't know until you try it, we felt like uh, playing it safer and getting the, the, the soil established the best way we knew how was the way to go. And so we knew we had to, we had to level it because we're stuck with the... Uh, because we're bound to this irrigation system, we were going to have to level it anyway. And if we're moving soil, let's get rid of the weeds while we're at it. All right, I will go ahead. Um, I, <clears throat> he's asking um, how you uh, did the seeding. Uh, did you broadcast it, uh, drill it, no-tail drill, um, or other? Uh, I'm going to say we, and my husband's going to grin in the background there. He's like, what's this we? <laughs> So uh, he, he and my son broadcast the seed. Um, and, and again, that was because um, the only seed drills we had locally just wouldn't handle the, the, you've got many different sizes of seed in that mix. 
and you have to adjust your seed drill to, to the size of your seed. Mm-hmm. And we just felt like we'd lose too much trying to work such a variety of seeds through it. So we'll, we're kind of holding our breath to see what happens with this. We're hope, we, we broadcast it. And then my son kind of went over everything with basically just a heavy chain dragging it to, to cover the seed. And then we irrigated. And we'll know in a few days what's coming up. You'll have to let us know how it, how it goes. Take pictures, you know, every couple of days. <laughs> you <laughs> <Right>? bet. <laughs> um, so, Andrew, did you get your question answered in, in what Mary just said? Yeah, I was going to say that drills have to be set to the seed size, so you'd have to do it. Now, were the did you have separate bags of all these? Uh, no, it was pre-blended. And okay. so uh, one thing, we did talk to uh, a grower who had been doing some of this cover crop seeding. What he said he would usually do is, is just fill a little bit of, at a time into the seeder because they're pre-mixed. And if you, if you throw the whole lot into a great big bin and start seeding, all your little stuff is gonna come out first and then you lose your big stuff. But if you just add a little bit of seed at a time and then go till that's empty and add a little bit more, you, you, your odds of keeping the mix mixed will, will be better. Uh, so the only place where we, where we did separate seedings was when we went back and added the native seed. I, I wanted to, uh, if anybody, has anybody else seen Kiss the Ground, the regenerative soil movie that has, uh, I see somebody clapping. It's amazing. It shows you all these very successful regenerative farmers and they talk about returns that are maybe a hundredfold of what their friends who are using chemicals and old school practices yeah, so, I've actually had conversations with Josh Tekel who produced Kiss the Ground. So, so I, I left a link up there at the beginning of the chat for everybody. Great. Right. Thanks for doing that, Andrew. Mary, would you address the resilience of the microbiome between extreme dry years and our normal wet years? Um, does, does it bounce back in those wetter years? So again, I think all of these extremes are, are questions of how dry was it? How wet was it? And what did you do in between? But the more your whole system is working, the more resilience that microbiome will have. So for example, you know, the ideal that we're trying to establish would be a cover crop that's diverse enough and dense enough that even in dry years, if we don't get the water, if there's some kind of you know, extreme heat, anything else that goes on, we will have maybe not all the crops in the mix growing, but, but there will be a cover on the ground. There will be enough of the heat loving plants that take over that the ground will be covered. And what's happening with the microbial community is to some degree going to reflect what's happening in the plant community. So if you're keeping your diversity in your plant community, you're gonna be keeping a diverse microbial ecology as well. Uh, The more, you know, in a hot, dry year, what's nice about the microbiome is that microorganisms can bounce back and evolve and adapt much more quickly than big organisms like plants and people can bounce back and evolve and adapt. And so as soon as conditions are right, they're going to recolonize. Those populations are gonna explode and and they're gonna fill in these niches. In the meantime, while it's dry, you will see different microorganisms rising to dominance. And these will be your, some of your archaea, some of your heat tolerant, you know, strains that, that do well in hot, dry conditions. And don't we have a great example of the ability of microorganisms to uh, adapt in the COVID virus? (laughs) (laughs) Variants popping around. Uh, Elaine Sullivan, you have your hand raised. Would you like to ask a question? Yes, thank you so much. 
I am part of the organization, the Alliance for Local Economic Prosperity. And we are, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Christina. We are passionate in our belief that regenerative agriculture is a critically important effort for us to move forward in every way we possibly can. Our belief is that if we had more public dollars that were directed through a public bank to supporting regenerative agriculture, that the benefits to us in terms of health and the environment, climate change, all those things and building community would be incredibly systemically important. We're making an assumption that, uh, that additional public dollars that were directed to this area of public good, regenerative agriculture, would in fact advance the research, advance all the experimentation that the wonderful people on this call are doing. Could you tell us, do you share that assumption that more public dollars would in fact advance this? Um, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to offend anybody in the group, but I've become a skeptic of public dollars. And a big part of that came out of my experience working with the government. Um, we see so much time and energy lost in every legislative session. I don't care if you're talking about the state level or the federal level. Um, it, it turns into a big dispute about who gets the money. And what I see working more effectively are, are many of the private groups, uh, you know, some of these foundations that are, that are supporting some of James and Joyce's work, some of these, uh, wh when you have private money going into a system, you're, you're more able to bypass the debate about how that money is spent and it can go directly to the purpose. Whereas I've seen so many, I've led programs that, that had all this potential and all this capacity to grow and you're moving along, you put all your resources, you lay your foundation, you get funded for, for a few seasons and then the political climate shifts and now you've got all this infrastructure, but no money to continue moving. And, you, and so your, your system collapses. I've seen uh, now that in recent years, we've been working more with, uh, with growers on different scales and you see the same sorts of things happening. You'll see people get loans through federal agencies to support the growth of their farm. A few of them, take that money and invest it well and, and build successful farms. But we see a lot of farms around town just here that haven't made it after they got the federal money and they're being foreclosed on or moved on. And so I think, so, so I'll say I'm a skeptic. I, I think the need is so great. I don't want to discourage anybody from taking that path that they have the most confidence in to, to build the soil health. But I kind of favor the private funding and the private investments. Uh, I, I'm sorry. When I've had my second shot, I would like to come to Fort Sumner and talk to you about public banking because I think there may be some aspects of it that would impact your skepticism. Thank you so much. I would love to visit with you. Fabulous. Okay. <clears throat> um, Bryce or Shelley, do you want to ask your question about native grasses? All right. Okay. Hopefully it's not too windy out here. Uh, still outside working. Uh, <laughs> But my question on the native grasses is why uh, they weren't recommended in an irrigation setting. Uh, it sounds like it's more than just a cost issue. Yeah, so, so we spoke with a couple of, uh, actually indirectly, my son was working with some, some natural resource uh, forestry people who, who had worked some with native grasses. And, and in his experience, the irrigation was... They, they weren't tolerating flood irrigation. And, and so when you started flood irrigating, and it might've just been matching the species to, to the situation, 
but the species that I had the most experience with and wanted the most to see established were all kind of a thumbs down in terms of their ability to tolerate flood irrigation. Now, that said, the other thing I did last summer was, was basically survey our land pretty closely to look for what natives were, were already growing there because as I said, it was somewhat undisturbed in terms of management and uh, it got flood irrigated every couple of weeks in the summer. And so you know that native seeds are coming in in that irrigation water and um, it was not, I wasn't seeing a lot of native grasses. Oh, that's not so serious. I think that did answer my question. Uh... One idea that we've been rolling around for our operation is to do short term, uh, by short term, I mean like three to five year perennial uh, rotations with our vegetable crops and uses those for grazing. Uh, if those were not flood irrigated or were you know, limited irrigation, do you think that that would still be a potential uh, do you think that would work or do you think we would still be better off going with a typical uh, like grazing mix, you know, it's like an endophyte free fescue, orchard grass, uh, you know, something that's a cheaper seed that given that we would be taking it out of production. Again. Yeah, I think right there, my, my, what you just said, the fact that it's very costly seed and you're gonna be taking it out of production in itself would almost suggest go with the seed that, you know, you're, you're really paying a heavy price for native seed. Now, if you could grow it and harvest your own seed and then replant that, that might be a different story. I think uh, the best I've been able to tell is that anything you do with native seed is going to be highly experimental. So don't bet the farm on it, but if you have some little corners, try it out, observe it, take good notes, and you might discover the next big thing. I'm actually, you know, my, my inner self that spent years looking with, working with grandma grasses, I just wanna see that grandma grass we planted take off and thrive and, and do great things for our field. But, um, but when we're all sitting at the table debating how we're gonna manage this land and I've gotta go up against my husband counting money and. <laughs> and look him in the eye and say, I know that, that the butyloa is gonna be the thing. I really don't know that. And so you have to manage. I, I think we started our operation with, with the resolve that sustainability has as much to do with your finances as with what's happening in nature. And if we can't pay our, you know, at the end of the day, if we can't, afford to stay in business, we do not have a regenerative farm. We cannot continue growing, improving the soil, improving the environment, and improving the, the food quality if the cash flow is gone. And so we have to make these compromises and, and going with a known um, technology is always going to, if you never deviate from the known technology, you'll never be at the cutting edge, but you've got to balance your experimental work with, with, uh, with things that you know are gonna give you a return on investment. Let's see, Melissa, do you wanna unmute and ask your question? Um, thank you so much. Very interesting, I really appreciate the, all of the wonderful information. I'm learning a lot. Um, you commented that there is great need for financing. And I'm wondering if you might be willing to elaborate on what some of those needs are. You mean in terms of our personal operation? In terms of perhaps your personal operation, but also uh, amongst the farming communities. Okay. Well, I, I just, you know, anytime you're farming, you're, you've invested, it takes a lot of investment in, in the crop, in the land, in the infrastructure before you start seeing something that's gonna pay you back. Uh, you need to invest in, in uh, I'm slowly coming to appreciate the marketing end of it. If you're not out there getting your name out there, you're, you're not gonna have a market for your product. Um, so I think that, you know, 
certainly in my lifetime, there's been this almost depressing trend in family farms going under and selling out and being foreclosed on because the competition just gets too rough, especially when you're going up against these large industrial farms that have contracts with your major food, food companies. Uh, this has been a very disturbing trend that has really defined my, my career life, my, my time in the workplace in terms of um, this is how long this has been happening. The promise I see with regenerative ag is that on one hand, it's very possible for a big commercial industrial farmer to implement regenerative practices. So it's no threat to industrial ag. I know some big farmers that have taken this path and they're loving the results they're getting. But it also opens a door for new people to get into the business and to start bringing some of the food system closer to home because I think it does tend to be more, um, the ups and downs are, are, are more balanced in a regenerative system and a diversified system. And so it's easier to manage it financially. Um, I'm trying to think what I said. Um, I, I think the costs where finances are needed are different for every farm. Uh, I know my husband and I waited until late in life to get into this in part because we didn't have a pocketbook to just go out there and buy a farm. And so we, we saved our pennies and, and you know, built, built some, had our careers in other fields and then came back and did this. But we didn't want to do it by borrowing money. We didn't want to do it um, by, by uh, partnering with other, in ways that, that gave us less control of the decision-making process. Context is everything, isn't it? <clears throat> Nancy, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, um, I'm actually, my question was uh, sort of prompted by, I'm reading Water in Plain Sight, uh, Judith Schwartz's book, and she talks a lot about, uh, so my question was just about water, like. Have you analyzed the water that you're using to irrigate and how do you think it's going to affect what happens in the soil and what happens to your plants? So surprisingly, we took exhaustive soil samples and never tested the water last summer. Uh, we, we know that it's high, it's somewhat saline. Uh, it's coming off, we're on the Pecos River. And uh, based on what you see growing in the area and this kind of thing, that's, that's some of what we're expecting. Something we like about our location in Fort Sumner is that uh, there aren't a lot of big cities upstream on the Pecos. And so we don't anticipate the kinds of industrial contaminants that you'd find on the Rio Grande. Um, it's a different watershed, but always with irrigation water, you're, you're you're bringing your water in from a very large region. You know, you're, you're draining the watershed, it's coming down the river and then it's going onto your land. And so you're bringing a lot of, you're bringing the environment to you with the water. I actually plan in the next couple of weeks to, uh, to draw some samples from the irrigation water and send it off for testing. We've just uh, found our hands pretty full since we got started and some things have had to wait and take priority over others. Okay, <clears throat> good. Well, I'm, I'm gonna um, pitch in with a question about soil tests uh, and, and Jay, you're, Mr. Class, you're gonna be next. Um, so Mary, do you, do you have any favored um, labs that you use for, for testing or are you doing all your own? Uh, the, the mineral testing I do with uh, Bob Perry out of Perry Ag Labs in Missouri. And I came across him through, actually I was, I participated in a conference very similar to this about, I mean, participants had similar interests to the Healthy Soil Group uh, that was put on by a bunch of farmers out of the Midwest back in, I think that was in 2016. But um, 
but from that group, many of them were using Bob Perry's lab. And he does an acetic acid extraction from the soil. So if you're familiar with different soil tests out there, uh, his is really looking at the mineral content that is bioavailable, that, that's plant extractable. And so you might have more phosphorus in the soil than his test is showing, but the logic behind it is that, uh, that the plants aren't necessarily getting that other soil, that other phosphorus, for example. Um, so one reason I went with him, probably the, the primary reason that I started using Bob was because out of all the soil consultants I visited with out of that network, uh, I'd say two thirds of them were using Bob Perry's lab after trying many and what they felt uh, they could attest to is that the results year after year after year when they were using his lab made sense. You know, they gave examples of going to other labs, getting their results. It said, oh, you're low in copper. So they'll go add a lot of, you know, recommended amounts of copper. And the next year they'd be lower in copper kind of thing. They're just, mm. you know, results all over the board. And they felt like they could manage better long-term with his results. And so I've been using him for about four or five years now, both, both with clients and with our own land. And uh, nothing has raised suspicion so far. I'm pretty happy with the service he provides. It's a family run business. They've been at it for many years and he's got a lot of experience and, and very much on the whole soil health. Um, you know, this, this group was doing soil health before people were using the term soil health. <laughs> Thank you. Cause we get asked that question a lot. Uh, Mr. Class, you want to go ahead? And I think you're going to be the last question before we close out here. Oh, Hey, that's fitting. How's it going, Mary? <laughs> Great to see you, Jeremy. I know it's awesome to see you. We're going to have to catch up, uh, offline and congrats on you guys. And with your endeavor, um, it's pretty awesome. So Enjoy it. Um, just beware that that uh, watershed's trending in some bad directions, model wise, as far as dealing with climate change, especially the Pecos. So just a heads up. Yeah. But um, <laughs> hey, so you mentioned something um, about your land conservation district, and did you guys reach out uh, to them or see what there was a, the availability? You got you mentioned that you're really you're rural. And so I'm kind of questioning about what kind of resources did you, were you aware that they maybe could provide for you or that were available to you or, you know, any, any, anything along those lines about what your water conservation district actually could or didn't have the ability to provide for you guys. Okay. Um, so you're talking like NRCS? Well, so I, oh, the, the, local the, reality, the reality, I guess, is so NRCS doesn't necessarily have the money to buy equipment and all that sort of stuff, right? That they have more money to provide programs, outreach, that sort of thing, where the conservation districts ultimately have some expendable budget to purchase certain equipment, you know, like no-till drills or whatever, um, where maybe some of the public funding could mm -hmm. be used better to purchase farming equipment that can, you know, that farmers can lease or use for sustainable practices. Mm -hmm. But I was just curious as just where you guys are at, if you were aware or what, what they could offer as far as that goes. Yeah. So we've looked at a few programs and so far, and, and we'll keep our ears open and keep talking to people, but so far, a lot of the programs that we looked at, for example, the laser leveling was one that we could have had done through NRCS. However, uh, we bought our property in, in uh, May of last year. Okay. Uh, their grant cycle would have held us back another year before we could have moved forward with it, just waiting for the RFPs to come through and some kind of evaluation and basically would have held us back that way. We did, uh, NRCS did actually come out and it took a lot of repeated uh, 
you you have to make yourself heard. Yeah, but, uh, they did help us, and we're very grateful for that with the uh, mapping of mm -hmm. the of the field, so that so that the gentleman who did our laser leveling for us could could calculate what he needed to do. Right. Okay. I will see, and I just I'm the, I was just thinking about availability and like how. So I guess it kind of goes with, you know, public outreach and what's available to people versus like tangible, you know, equipment to implement sustainable practices as opposed to programs and resources and that sort of thing. Well, yeah. and that was something else. I mean, at one time we had priced a, a cedar, uh -huh. a no-till drill, and uh, we were open to purchasing it. And we sat down and thought, you know, we really intend for this crop to take off and we're never, it's permanent. We're not right. going to have to plant again. And so why invest in this permanent piece of equipment to use it one season and maybe five, 10 years down the road have to reseed versus, you know, it's not like somebody who's going to have to keep going in and keep reseeding for a different kind of crop. Right, and so that I think was, I guess my question was geared to like what the actual conservation district had available for things like that, because for that same exact reason, it's pointless for you to invest in that. But as a collective, where a resource is available for multiple people, especially associated with the price, it was just a thought. Yeah. And, and I think what we're seeing just happens on the ground is, is uh, we've almost got that kind of a co-op going, exchanging tools and equipment with farmers in the, in the area. Now it's not going to be the latest. It's not going to be the no-till drill. Most of these are hay farmers and, and yeah. this kind of thing. But, uh, but we've been able to get, so far, we have not been for want of equipment in some cases we've borrowed or traded services or done other things. And in some cases we've, we've bought what we need. We've bought a lot of used equipment mm -hmm. and uh, your dollar goes a lot farther that way. I think my husband and my son have become pretty skilled at tractor mechanics and uh, you know, things, things just kind of work out. So, but, but we looked at several programs that, that, offered funding and over and over again, either the grant cycles just weren't gonna match when we needed to be doing these things or the population they were targeting, you know, there's, there are income brackets that you have to fall in the right definition of and there's a lot of this kind of thing to where it's really uh, not as accessible as it looks like on paper. Right, so it's not all that inclusive. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. I'll, I'll chime in a little bit from our experience with the districts. Uh, uh, we are aware that in uh, the Mora district has a lending library of tools. Um, and my district, Edgewood, which is based in Moriarty, has a no-till drill that is currently for sale because nobody wants to come in and use it. Really? So I'll put, yeah, I mean, put that out there. If anybody wants to buy one, it's used. <laughs> and, and I have no idea what the district is asking for it, but um, it's there. And I, I, I hate to see it sitting in our bay, uh, it, you know, idle. It's, it's um, a travesty that to have that piece of equipment sitting there and, and not be used. So Christina, but. who would somebody contact if they were? <laughs> the, I will email you, Mary, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and let you know who to get in touch with. You know, David Johnson is actually kind of interested in it too. So you may have to bid it, outbid him. But um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right. Well, we are a few minutes over here and I'm going to turn this over to Isabel with a very, very sincere thank you, Mary, for this. This is wonderful. Well, I want to thank all of you because it was great. It's just great hearing the ideas coming in from the community and seeing the excitement over this, this field right now.